Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> right. Well, here we are in this experimental situation. So, shall we introduce ourselves? I, I'm Malcolm Baker. I teach at the University of Southern California, and I'm a curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, and I come to this really from um, the study of earlier sculpture, particularly of the 18th century. I'm Ruth Butler. Uh, I'm a retired professor from the University of Massachusetts, and I've been working on Rodin's sculpture all my scholarly life. Uh, three things I'd mention, uh, that I worked with Al Elson on putting together Rodin Rediscovered at the National Gallery in 1981, one of the first great blockbuster exhibitions. And um, I've cataloged that collection, the National Gallery, which is one of the most important collections in the country, mostly lifetime works. And uh, that I uh, published a biography of Rodin in 1993, uh, Images of Man. Oh, no, that's another book. Um, uh, and uh, that that was the first biography of Rodin that was based on uh, the archives, which had recently been opened. Uh, I'm Andrew Lins. I'm, uh Served at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where the Rodin Museum is under our uh, uh, administration. I'm Joel Shapiro. I'm a sculptor and not an expert on Rodin, but I'm interested. <laughs> and I hope I have some insight. And uh, my name is David Getze. I'm a, a Getty postdoctoral fellow and a visiting scholar at Harvard University. And I work on modern sculpture from uh, the 19th century to the present day. Good. So um, that's who we are. Um, perhaps I should say, as the moderator, something about the format of, of, of these three sessions. Um, we'll have uh, changing groups for each of the three groups of works. Um, but both myself and David will be constants, as it were. Um, just as this show is really very innovative, and I can't actually think of any other show, or very few shows, which have gathered together versions of the same works yeah. um, from, from, from yeah. this period. Well, Anyhow. Rosso that we all Rosso, saw. Rosso, <laughs> yes, of course, yes, yes. And until recently. Yeah. Right. And then um, 1975, Metamorphosis right. at Harvard yeah. University. Yeah. But gathered it's still, together, it's 19th still, century It's cast, still yeah. rather unusual, right. so it's really rather innovative yeah. to, to do this. Um, I think also, uh, this format is innovative. That is innovative. And very we're, innovative. We're, we're very much feeling our way here. So we, we, we've no idea what's going to happen. Um, but I hope this will work. So we'll have uh, this discussion here. And um, in each of the three sessions, we'll have an art historian um, giving us an introduction and then a response from a conservator. And then we'll have a general discussion. And then we'll migrate back into the auditorium and to have a discussion with, 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 with everybody. But the whole point of having a small, very small group here is that we can be in front of the works and talk around the works. So that's the, that's the format. And perhaps we can begin with Ruth. I hope that some of the people here have been able to walk into this gallery and look at a distance at the three bronze casts and think about the differences. Some of you might have known already that one of them had been left outdoors. Two of them have always been inside. And that all three were done by the same foundry, by Rudier. And um, they're only five years apart. One was done in Rodin's lifetime in 1915. One was done around 1920. And one was done. Uh, posthum uh, well, two posthumous, and one is done 1925. It would be easy, I think, to pick out the Philadelphia cast, 1925, and, uh, because it has been out of doors. But play with the other two and see what you think, a posthumous cast and a lifetime cast. And I won't say any more about that now. Now, um, we're talking about multiples and casts and many versions. But when we talk about the Age of Bronze, what we want to think about is that it is a truly unique work in Rodin's oeuvre. First of all, um, it is a, uh, a life-size work. 
you'll see other works that feel life-size, like Eve or St. John the Baptist, but they're over life-size. They read as life-size, but this is a life-size work, and that's a unique aspect of it. Um, a, another unique aspect is that Rodin worked on it for a long time, for a year and a half. Uh, you think about the Balzac, he worked on it for about six years, but there are many, many, many versions, studies, all sorts of uh, approaches to the subject. With the Age of Bronze, this is what we have. He worked on the clay, full size, for a year and a half, and he never did that again. And uh, another aspect of its uniqueness is that he did it in a foreign country, in Belgium. He did it for the purpose of getting him home again. Um, and another aspect of its very special place in the life of Rodin, the career of Rodin, is that it was the impetus, it's what got him the most important commission of his life, the work we call the Gates of Hell. So it's, it's absolutely unique and crucial. Um, Rodin began working on this in uh, the second half of 1875. He was living in Brussels with his mistress, Rose Buret, and uh, he hired a soldier, and that's very important because uh, it's the beginning of our thinking about Rodin as didn't, a man who didn't like professional models, that preferred to find, to really begin to form the model, the physical person himself in terms of sculpture. And also it had meaning uh, because he had a lance, had the soldier hold the lance in his, in his hand, and it was a reference to the war. Rodin had left uh, France because of the Franco-Prussian War in a kind of economic exile. And so the war was still a big subject, and this begins as a subject that's related to a warrior uh, figure. Um, but as he said to Truman Bartlett, who was, uh, gave, had interviews with Rodin in the 70s, in the 80s. Um, I began with a sense of a warrior, but by the time I was really working out, I just wanted to do a beautiful nude sculpture, um, something that was very cohesive, that hung together. In the middle of work, um, he decided he had to see Italy, so he went to Italy for one month uh, in 1876, to see Michelangelo and to see works of antiquity that would play into his inspiration. He came back to Brussels, finished the work, and had it ready to show in 1877, in January. And um, by the way, Niet, Auguste Niet, gave interviews about modeling for this. He said it was really tough. He would work uh, three and four hours a day. Uh, an hour at a time that Rodin did not want muscles to be too tight or too prominent. Um, and so he had to keep changing the pose and getting just the right position. Um, so they showed it, and he had some help from a critic to decide on the title, which he gave it its warrior title, calling him Le Vincu, the vanquished one. Um, everyone has also seen that title, not only a reference to the, the war he fled, but also uh, to himself, that there's a self-portrait element in this, and I, I absolutely believe that, that, there's a, that Rodin feels himself. So he put together and showed this, this figure, which seems to grow the way the, the feet are close together, the knees come apart, tight hips, chest expanding, arms moving away from the body, and the head slightly up. And so it's a growing figure. He suppressed the lance for exhibition, and this made a lot of confusion. People didn't know what it really meant. Uh, it lost its warriorness. And um, then he prepared it for the big homecoming, to be in the Salon of 1877 in Paris. And so he thought he better change the title because it hadn't worked in Brussels and he changed it to the Age of Bronze. And this too is very contemporary because um, Le Comte de Lille had just uh, translated into French Hesiod. So it was the ages of man, the third age of man. And so it has this whole sense of growth and uh, awakening and uh, that was very much a part of it. A very ugly thing had happened in Brussels actually. 
because in one of the newspaper reviews, somebody said, what part casting from life has played in this statue, we cannot tell. Of course, Rodin was furious, and he wrote letters to the editor, and so forth and so on. The slur followed him to Paris, and uh, was always repeated. People said, we don't know what part casting plays, or I believe that it's an honest work. Nevertheless, it's a rather crass work. So the reviews were not particularly good. Um, Rodin felt that he had to prove that his figure was honest, that it was not a cast for life, which was a perfectly legitimate 19th century practice. And so um, he went to the head of the Fine Arts Commission and uh, got no response at all from the Marquis de Chenevier. Three years later, he went, or two years later, 1879, Edmund Turquet becomes Minister of Fine Arts. He goes to Turquet, and Turquet, who had seen and liked the the work in, the, in its plaster form in the uh, Salon of 1877. And Tourquet said, uh, let's get a commission together. Artists will look at it. They came back with, with a couple reports, the final one good, that it was really an excellent work from an outstanding sculptor. And so the state purchased it. And then the first bronze cast, which this is not, um, was, uh, we can think about bronzes now, uh, was uh, commissioned by the state. Uh, they paid um, 2,000 francs for the plaster and paid 2,200 francs to have it cast in bronze by Thébault, by the foundry Thébault. And um, the, the rest of the history in the 19th century is that by 1884, the bronze cast was moved into the Jardin de Luxembourg where it stayed until 1879, and it was then shown at the Universal Exhibition, the uh, great exhibition of the Tour de Fel. And that's what we saw in the th that's, what, that's what we saw. Well, we saw the one in the garden. Yes. That's the one. That's the only one that existed. So they moved that indoors for uh, the show, only for the show, 1889. Rodin, as I said, I stood up and said he wanted it to be restored for the show. Uh, they didn't do it. They moved it back into the garden and uh, where it remained until the end of the century. Um, in, Rodin had a lot of blows in the 90s, and so he was a very depressed sculptor, but Judith Cladell organized a great exhibition in, in 1899 for Brussels and Amsterdam. Uh, actually, for, it had four venues in, in uh, the lowlands, and she wanted to put it in, and he said, no, no, no. I've done better things since, let's not bother. And she tells a story in her, uh, one of her books. She said, I took him to the garden, the Jardin de Luxembourg, and began to sort of slowly walk him over toward the Boulevard Saint-Michel um, into the grove where it was. And he stood for a long time, and he looked at it, and he said, it really is beautiful. And, um, so he accepted, re-accepted it to his work, which he had thought was overworked up, up until that point. And it was shown in the uh, great 1900 retrospective in bronze in the Centennial Exhibition and in plaster in his own personal retrospective. And after that, it became a world phenomenon. The orders began to pour in. It is the most exhibited work of Rodin's in history. I don't can't say it has the most cast, but it's the most exhibited work. The Germans came after it madly. They were the first. And uh, Americans bought it too, but th this is when it comes to the 19th century. Let me... Perhaps Andrew can sort of take it up in yes. terms of the... Yes. Talk about the cast. The cast. Yeah. 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 Well, well, maybe even beginning a little bit further back because of uh, what was uh, said uh, earlier, uh, regarding the, uh, the condition and whether Rodin really cared what happened to the pieces afterwards, the fact that in, in 89, just four or five years after this piece was in the Luxembourg uh, garden, not this, these pieces, but the original, he actually wanted to, he has two letters he, he writes about it. In one of them, he says he wants to nettoyer patiner the bronze. And the next letter, in, a couple months later in, in uh, uh, April, he says he just wants to clean them, a little business of cleaning. But he obviously cared quite, 
quite a bit as to how the appearance of his patina and his forms were looking after a series of very bad weather, apparently, in Paris. Um, and he uh, went to the effort of trying to bring the piece to his studio, as we're saying, unsuccessfully, to uh, have it brought back to a closer uh, approximation of what he really originally intended. And we see that in, in other of his correspondence when there's something that's occurred uh, unexpectedly to the bronzes in the case, for instance, of Max Lindy's um, example that was cast along with just about the same time that the uh, Jacobson casts were done in 1901, 1900, 1901. Uh, this one. Uh, well, not, the, not this very one, but another version of this where uh, within uh, uh, probably six or eight months of the piece having been exposed outdoors, uh, there was a flaw in the way it was cast, and it was joined with lead. Yeah. And Lindy writes very unhappily to Rodin that there's something the matter with this version, this uh, state, and uh, that he wishes to have the piece replaced. Rodin is extremely upset. He says the, sculpt, the founder who had worked for him and uh, sent him that piece, which had been rushed to begin with, uh, no longer works for him, and it was supposed to be cast in one piece by Lost Wax, and he will replace it. And, he, and frankly, he makes a very rapid uh, replacement. Within two months or so, he has the, uh, a new uh, Age of Bronze sent to Lindy, and Lindy talks about its patina and so on in his correspondence with him, which is uh, recorded in the Detroit Institute of <laughs> Arts uh, uh, bulletin. But in that example, and actually also in further correspondence, you see that Rodin is very worried that the patina show properly initially. But then he says almost more than once in his correspondence, but uh, some of these things are up to nature and I can't control and that, that he actually even writes a, a little regime for keeping the patina as stable, that is, the, so that the surface state remains as stable as possible by washing once a year. Uh, that's a little, uh, uh, so, so where do these stand? Well, where do these stand in this regard? Is it inevitable that all outdoor sculpture will change yeah. and alter? And I think the real, I mean, I think the, is there any, when you look at these three pieces, the three bronzes, does it really matter that one's more eroded, less eroded, mm -hmm. one's brown, one's black, one's green? I mean, the work is so depictive in itself that it kind of overwhelms the surface variation. The surface aspect is really secondary. Now, if it's destructive to the sculpture, change it. But if it's not, let it be. But doesn't, doesn't the surface really play a major role in, 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 in the way we view? No, I think his work is so depictive right. that well, it's the depiction that, that really is significant. But the, but the and, way... You know, I would have to disagree entirely. I think one of the things that we need to understand about this sculpture is how remarkable it was in relationship to what had come before it. The 19th century relied on a very um, precise and elaborate vocabulary of the figure that relied upon clearly articulated anatomical structures and what in the 19th century they called naturalistic or, or the freshness of the surface looks very different than what Rodin's doing here. There's all these great anecdotes about him climbing up on ladders, trying to look at the model from all of these different viewpoints and, and studying the way that changes in light, his own position and the, the model's movements really alter the way we look at that body. And so what he does in this work that's so remarkable is tries to capture that physical and temporal engagement, that moving in and around the, the figure by working on the surface itself. Because in a Rodin sculpture, beginning in this work and continuing, I think, through all of them, the surface is this membrane that represents the contact point between the sculptor, the material object, and the viewer's vision. And that's why, and he put so much emphasis on this, on the fleetingness of the perception. So if we look at these figures, they're, they're wonderful to have all three together because you see that they are still, they're all the same, but yet they're remarkably different. And part of that comes through the subtle faceting that he did across the surface. So unlike um, an earlier 19th century naturalistic figure where we would see the pectorals clearly articulated here, it's almost difficult to figure out where they begin and where they end. 
and this is what we're supposed to do. And this is his own process emphasized. And, and the Pat Wyden, because that has a green patina, and that one has a brown patina, how do you perceive one bicep as different? Well, yeah. I think the I mean, vision... That's, that's what I'm asking. I mean, well, yeah. I think they're remarkably different, because this is Why? really interesting in relation what to... What aspect of the form is different? I mean, just let, perception. Let, I, I want to jump in there, because I think that's a really important point. Um, 19th century practice for successful sculptors like Carpeau or Carrier Belouz, the people who prefigured him, they had shops. You could turn out what you could sell and put it in the shop, and people would come in and they would see things that were very, very similar. And Rodin didn't want to be one of those people. He turned things out by order. And I find if we had three that had been produced by the same um, founder in the same time and had the same finish here, we would not find this as interesting an exhibition as it is. And I, mean, so, I think it's, I think yeah. it's interesting and it's pleasing, but I, I'm just talking about whether you, whether you have to return <clears throat> return the sculpture to this mythic original state, which nobody knows what it is anyway, yeah. or they have a yeah. vague idea what it is. And why bother doing that? Why not stabilize it? I mean, in this piece, which is highly eroded, you see you have a greater sense of the internal structure of the sculpture. Mm. You can you, see the seams and the welds and the, this in, and the in that. In a sense, this is much easier to look at, isn't it, than, 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 than this? You see, <clears> you it's more see abstract. More detail. Exactly. The forms change more too, and I was thinking in the discussion in the larger room, we can do this now because there's a big, sophisticated public. You can have good wall, uh, you know, wall pieces that explain about casts and explain mm -hmm. where it's come from. It, you know, not long ago, it was just simply the name, the date. You didn't even have when it was cast right. because that would have been confusing. Yes. You know, but yes. now people are interested in that, so we have a different audience. Yeah. And, and yep. we can do different things. And I, I find, of course, I mean, Rodin, the seams come out here very strongly, uh, which you don't see on yeah. the pieces that haven't been outside. Now, Rodin did not emphasize seams so early. No, that's right. He that's didn't that's want that's you to see the seams <laughs> until it's really in the 1890s he begins to think that seams are interesting. Yeah. And so but here, 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 we can now yeah. read that. Yeah. And, yeah. and we huge. find that interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think it's interesting information. It is interesting I mean, I don't know if it destroys one's perception of Rodin's intent. So not that's ours. Not. Well, but, yeah. well, we have to remember that intent theirs, is a flexible... That's well, a, a, intent yes, is yes. flexible. We're talking about someone who lived quite a long time, right. who's not going to have the same opinions. And this is what Ruth's point was. He's changed greatly. So if we, changed. if we look at the, um, the bronze cast that's, in, um, that's the darkest, I mean, Malcolm's very correct to say that it's difficult to see um, some of the facets and what's going on on the surface, in part because there's such an evenness to the tone. And so we, with the, um, the weathered version, or also with the plaster, we can pick up those differentiations and see his modeling a little bit better, but kind of one of the things that he was, I think, emphasizing was how difficult it should be to fix those details in the darkness of the bronze for which the, it was intended. One of the claims that it was um, cast from life is because it just seemed to be too complex for any one sculptor to have done it. Yeah. And that's what's so, I mean, that's really why it was called so remarkably real, to, you know, to quote. If a piece is dark, it amplifies the mass. I mean, I think. It's interesting. Yeah. You called it a brown cast, which the San Francisco catalog calls it a brown what, cast. What a color is it? I, I don't read it that way. Well, yeah. What do you see? It's well, well, it's. it's well, I know, but it's overall. Yeah. The, the overall if you were to foundry and you wanted something to look like that, you'd talk about brown and green and ferric yeah, but, oxide. But the difference yeah. between then and now is that a lot of the foundries that would produce a brown patina would have a one layer of brown patina. And this is actually built up a much more oh, yeah. sophisticated yeah. way. Well, no, it's a hot patina. Yeah, but it's you actually can't several do a hot, layers. Right. Yeah, but that's always <laughs> Well, no, no, I like to say this isn't the case with all of the bronzes, and certainly the later casts that were done after no. the 1952 and so on, no, the variation in the surface is very different. But at, at foundries, you know, they use cold patinas and hot patinas. Exactly. But a hot mm -hmm. patina always requires a certain amount of applications of the chemical. Uh, of oh, depth. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's this endless yeah. heating and, yeah. you know, buffing and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, yeah my, my comment, uh, Joe, was only that in the case of the Rudier foundry and certainly the Lime uh, uh, patination shop that produced probably all of these uh, 
patinas uh, that they were pretty uh, careful to build up a, a patina that they knew Rodin approved of. And right. he actually talks quite a few times to uh, Limay, corresponds yeah. with him, and vice versa about what the thickness of the coloration of the patina will be, and that it be just so. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they obviously had a, a, a great understanding between each other as to what was an acceptable right. appearance. And Limay also actually does quite a bit of comment on the quality of the cast that he receives prior to the, <laughs> prior to the, um, to the uh, uh, patination process. But, but even indoors, the patina will evolve. I mean, it's, 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 yes, that's absolutely right. So I mean, right. I, I, so, I, mean I still don't know lives. exactly in, what, unless they're color photographs yeah. of, you know, Rodin's hat off the press and he's looking at it that we know what yeah. indeed the standard was. But to, well, to see it as a sort of fixed point, something it's very absolute difficult is, it's, is misleading. Yeah, no, it's, it's kind of a red it? herring. And so, uh, from some uh, perspectives, to, to I mean, not, continue not, to not go after thing. this sort of originary state is, um, well, especially with multiple casts well, well, that I'm going to tell you from having done quite a series of uh, X-ray diffraction and other analyses of older uh, patina, patinas that we've made, that even the patina that looks stable and visually is the same from a crystallographic point of view depending on the chemistry of the patina, it will actually change even at room temperature protected from in the period of five years and the period of 10 years. Depends on the chemistry yeah. of the patination. Right. They are not stable. They're not made of no. stable chemicals. They alter subtly. And the analysis that you make 10 years ago will not be the same as the analysis you make now for quite a few patinas that I mean, are applied at Rodin's shop. Well, patina yes. itself is about age. I mean, it really is about, it's a, some attempt to emulate some That's classical right. situation. That's right. I mean, and I think, you know, sculptors of all, you know, I prefer not to patinate these. I wish they would patinate themselves. Yes. I mean, but, 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 but Joel, you, don't you agree that the vagaries of handling shipping and so on, Have for him were so, uh, it's obvious that he wanted to control the appearance. He couldn't let yeah. just no, nature no, I'm not, take no, over I'm not on, saying that on that Rodin, point, right? I don't think there's anything wrong with Petita, but I'm just saying that I don't know what, you know, I don't know, I don't know enough about Rodin to know what, I, what I, he I, wanted. I wonder, I wonder say when we're, we're talking about that, and, and the, and the version, decorative. And the version, very version essence in, is decorative. in leaves, it decorative has this sort of, sort of association of, 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 of with, with, with the antique. I mean, it looks mm -hmm. a bit like a Herculaneum patina. Um, yeah. And it has sort of age value. Well, and that may be one of the attractions. Yes. Yeah. Rodin well, got into that it, it, it sort of intellectually right. later yeah. in his life. He really thought about it. I mean, in the mm -hmm. 90s, you begin to get uh, dull, right. green yeah. patinas the, the, under the influence of antiquity. Yeah. But that's, again, it's a later Rodin. It's not yeah, this yeah. Rodin. Yeah. There's a way to refocus this idea, I think, um, in terms of the variability of Rodin's intentions. And that's also not just through patina, which we're focusing a lot on, but also the very idea of casting. Um, as Ruth um, said, when it started, the Age of Bronze was a unique cast, which is why he placed so much emphasis on the quality of that cast. But in Rodin's career, casting became a conceptual endeavor for him, especially in plaster. So you look at the gates of um, hell, the same figure will be repeated. This is because he was playing with the very ideas of replication and reproducibility as, con as the conceptual... It part of his style. It is. Yeah. It's the conceptual meat and potatoes of sculpture. But not now. Not, not in well, here. No, but what's interesting yeah. is that as the later cast, I think we, we might be able to confidently say that the later um, works that are cast, regardless of when, they were, when the original form was sculpted, that his attitudes towards allowing them um, to change also changed, is that he can see that it, now that, much like Penelope was saying, now that he's got multiple ages of bronze out there, that there may be um, some value to those levels of chance and variability I mean, and we, reproducibility we, we, that we, we, have been referenced earlier. So. We talk about the, 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 this as Rodin's first major work, and, and Ruth very eloquently described that. But, but the fact that he went on producing versions of it means that it, 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 as it were, crops up all through his career, isn't well, it? Well, I think yeah. it's interesting that he turned his back on it more or less. Oh, really? I yeah, mean, yeah. When, when he ah, finally let it go to the mold maker, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just, it killed yeah. him to yeah. release it. But then 
he did things that were so different and yes. that he was so excited yes, about. Exactly. He turned his back on it. Yeah. And I love the story of Judith Ladell that she has to take him into the garden to rediscover his yes. youth. That's, that's it's lovely. a very beautiful yes, yes. story. Can, before we go back into the auditorium, can we just turn to the, the plaster? Yes, because I, I, I want to say <coughs> also one more thing before right. we go back. Yes. And that is, as the orders began to pour in in the first decade of the 20th century, they would come in with avec feu de vigne or sans feu de vigne, with a fig leaf or without yes. a fig leaf. <laughs> Interesting to figure out how many really, really wanted the fig leaf. That's right, uh, but, but sort of on that same uh, point that you were making, Ruth, the, the plasters were often sent to expositions as a kind of advertisement for sale. And one of the things that Rodin was pretty um, worried about, apparently, was the way in which his plasters were handled. And the fact that he would ship them a long way, they cost him a lot to make a nice, bright, white plaster, s send them a long way away, they come back dirty and broken. Oh. A and he writes about that with some aggravation uh, in his uh, work. So he, he didn't let everything go. I no, mean, no, well, he, he was, he was always, he was yeah. always uh, uh, careful that his work showed to best advantage so it could be sold. I, well, I, I like I the tell works a story to be. in the Philadelphia uh, cast, which is very important. Um, Paul Bartlett, young sculptor, studio on Rue de Beaujard, just down the uh, street from Rodin, and a worshiper of Rodin, um, wanted, there was no Rodin figure in the United States, and he wanted that there would be one. So um, he got involved with the Pennsylvania Academy to acquire the Age of Bronze in plaster. And this is remarkable that in, in this country we had one figure, the Age of Bronze in plaster in 1996, but he sort of pulled the wool over everybody's eyes because the Pennsylvania Academy and many people in this audience know about the scandal of Aikens of uh, being fired because he was working with nude models as part of the instruction for, t for, for students and that this was unacceptable. So, Paul Bartlett introduced in 1996, he, or he commissioned it in that year, um, an age of bronze in plaster that would be a model for students to use instead of nude models, live models. And so it comes under that auspices. Now, Rodin had no idea that it wasn't going as a work of art. And he sold it because Paul Bar Bartlett was his friend for $120, it was way under cost. And uh, so it went into the Philadelphia Academy. They did put it in art show, but they didn't say they owned it. They didn't want anyone to know. And I found this work in, 18, in 1980s in the corridor of the Pennsylvania Academy, all dusty, scratches on it in a terrible condition, still there as a plaster cast. Well, that's where it was drawn for years by the kids who went to the right. academy. I, in fact, I went to the academy and we used to draw. That's right. That's that, right. It was treated very roughly yeah. and I wrote without to much Mr. respect. And I and said, get that thing out of there. <laughs> well, this is, in, terms of the, in terms of the use of the plasters and thinking of this one in, 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 in particular, I mean, it isn't that, just to sort of clarify this, it isn't that there was one plaster and then all the bronzes came from that. The, the, the plasters, there were, there, were, there were different versions of them, which were they, then themselves used in the production of the, right. the molds for the bronzes. Uh, actually, is, that, is, that, well, is that fair um, enough? What that? becomes a normal Rodin practice, not quite at this time, but later on, is to make between six and 12 plasters of every work. Right. So it was there to be used when the, when the first one fell apart. Right. And the, the original plaster did fall apart. It was... Uh, a, was reproduced in the 90s. The, 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 they turned out four or m as many as seven. Antoinette Lenormand is not sure, but four exist now. Yeah. That came from that 90s. Right. And uh, uh, casting. Right. Yeah. Yes. And and what you see here, these various lines, um, are in part the evidence of taking molds. Yeah. From that's a part and, and of that's the later, and I assume from that's Rudier. definitely a part of mine, I think. Yeah. <coughs> I, I'm assuming that this comes from Rudier. Yes. Yeah. 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 From from that's... his great. Uh, yes. Founder. Yeah. 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 Good. I think it's probably time to return to um, 
the auditorium and to engage with other voices. Thank you. Only mic back and forth. Um, yeah.